very nice to be visiting Kias again, though this time virtually. Um, my talk today is uh, titled Constraining Tree Level Gravitational Scattering and is based on the, the following three papers. Um, the, uh, these two papers are out. Um, and this, uh, this, this paper is on ongoing work that should appear hopefully not too, not too far in the future. Okay, um, so let me start this talk with a sort of pro provocative sounding introduction. Consider type two B, let's say type two string theory, uh, compactified on a manifold of the form RP times M, where uh, M is some internal manifold. So for instance, P could be four and M could be a Calabiao manifold, or P could be six and M could be a K3 manifold, and so on. Now, such a compactification defines a quantum theory of gravity in RP. And um, at the quantum, that is by which I mean the loop level, uh, scattering amplitudes of the P-dimensional gravitons depend in detail, uh, depend sensitively on the details of the manifold, uh, uh, the manifold M. So for instance, if you computed one loop scattering of gravitons um, in R4 with some Calabiao compactification, the one loop, one loop gravitational scattering amplitude would be an interesting and intricate function of the mod moduli of the color. Okay. However, it is an it's an obvious, but nonetheless remarkable and perhaps uh, underappreciated fact um, that this dependence on the uh, um, the uh, the details of the the detailed structure that, uh, of the compactification manifold essentially drops out at the classical or tree level. Okay, this statement follows uh, immediately from two facts. Um, uh, the first is that the vertex operators for the graviton lie entirely in the RP part of the conformal field. And the second fact is that the sphere, uh, the Riemann surface, the sphere uh, on, which you're, uh, on which you compute correlation functions uh, in order to compute tree level scattering amplitudes in string theory, that sphere has no moduli. Okay, so the dependence on, uh, of tree level scattering amplitudes, gravit on tree level scatter scattering amplitudes on, uh, um, on the part of the conformal field theory that does not enter into the correlation function. So the M part of the conformal field theory is entirely in the form of a partition function, a sphere partition function of that conformal field theory. And since that sphere partition function has no moduli, there's no, it's, a, it's an overall constant in the, integ, integ, uh, in the vertex operator integrations that you need to do in order to compute uh, graviton scattering amplitude. And so it can be taken outside, outside uh, overall uh, outside that integral. Okay, so the dependence of these gravitational scattering amplitudes on the nature of the compactification manifold is very simple. It's through a single number, namely the sphere partition function of that conformal field theory that sits over, overall outside all scattering amplitudes. The same number for 3.4 point, 7 point, a million point gravitational scattering amplitudes. And because it's the same number that sits overall outside uh, all amplitudes, it can be effectively absorbed into a redefinition of the p-dimensional Newton constant. So up to a redefinition, up to the fact that the p-dimensional Newton constant gets rede redefined, sphere scattering amplitudes, the tree level gravitational scattering amplitudes, have basically no dependence on the uh, on the nature of the compactification manifold. Okay, um, it also follows, though I would need to tell you a few more. It takes two or three more minutes, and I won't take the time to, to explain it. It also follows that uh, uh, you can easily argue that uh, uh, tree level graviton scattering amplitudes are the same for type 2a theory as well as type 2b theory. Th that the scattering amplitudes for 2a theory on some manifold is the same as scattering amplitudes for 2b theory on some other manifold. Uh, also, the type 1 scattering amplitudes are, are the same as the type 2a and type 2b at tree level. So what does all this mean? Restated classical type 2 theory on Rp times n admits a consistent truncation to a universal, that is M independent theory, which describes the interactions of the p-dimensional gravitons, as well as an infinite number of additional fields. Roughly speaking, this infinite number of additional fields is some subset of all the fields whose vertex operators lie entirely in the RP part of the conformal field. Okay, classic 
basically, then we see that is a consistent truncation to a sort of universal subsector. And uh, uh, the subsector is universal in the sense that it does not depend on the compactification manifold M. And this is an exact statement about classical string theory. Okay, it's not some low energy truncation or something like that, just exact uh, structural feature of classical string theory. Heterotic and bosonic string compactifications also admit consistent truncations to their own universal sectors. The universal truncation to the hetero in the heterotic string is different from that of the type 2 string. The universal truncation of the bosonic string is different from that of heterotic and type 2. Okay. Um, I want to emphasize that this, this, this consistent truncation is a rather surprising fact, at least to me. It's a surprising fact because it doesn't follow from any, um, any, any, uh, any obvious um, space-time symmetries. You know, sometimes you can argue for consistent truncations because of because if, if your theory has a symmetry and then the consistent truncation to all fields that uh, are invariant under that, that symmetry is, is sort of automatic. Often consistent truncations happen for this reason. This is not in that, in that class. It's from the point of view of space time, it seems a bit like a miracle. Okay, so we've looked at these, uh, um, we've looked at these string, uh, string graviton uh, scattering amplitudes and their sort of surprising consistent truncation, classically speaking. Um, now, there's another, apart from these string theory scattering amplitudes, in my talk, I will be interested in one more scattering amplitude that, that uh, all of us are familiar with in gravity, namely the uh, tree level gravitational scattering amplitude that follows from the Einstein S matrix. Okay, so now ignoring the bosonic string because of its well-known uh, uh, pathologies, uh, in this, in our talk so far, we've surveyed three distinct classical, by, and whenever I say classical in this talk, I mean tree level, three distinct tree level gravitational scattering amplitudes. There's the Einstein tree level scattering amplitude, the type two tree level scattering amplitude, and the heterotic tree level scattering amplitude. Now, as far as I'm aware, these examples exhaust the set of classical S matrices that emerge as the good approximation to the full string theory S matrix in any parametric limit of string theory. The parametric uh, limit, uh, in, uh, limits relevant to the enumerated examples are G string goes to zero with no restriction on energy for the type two and the heterotic S matrices. And uh, the energy goes to zero with no, uh, uh, no restriction on GS for the Einstein S matrix. Okay, now so far all we've done is make some some observations which are obvious observations, but still somehow in my, to my mind, interesting. And uh, uh, these observations uh, uh, provoke the following bold conjecture. Okay, uh, this is a conjecture I'm gonna call conjecture one in this talk. And conjecture one stated as follows. The cl classical Einstein S matrix, the tree level type two S matrix, and the tree level heterotic S matrix constitute the exhaustive list of consistent tree level S matrices of gravity. Restated, every consistent classical gravitational theory admits a consistent truncation to one of these, one of the three universal sectors we've described above. Universal sector of Einstein gravity or the universal sector of the type two theory or the universal sector of the heterotic. So now there are many words I've used in this conjecture and some of the words need, need explanation. So what do I mean by tree level S matrix? Well, that's clear. A tree level S matrix is an S matrix whose only singularities, whose only non-analyticities and momenta are poles that correspond to the, exchange, to the exchange of some uh, representation of the little group, a massive or massless little group in the appropriate dimension. What do I mean by the word consistent in this conjecture? That's a little harder to define. But what I mean is a theory that obeys all the general low energy, you know, all the good properties that we expect of classical theory, which includes, but may not eventually be limited to, causality and boundedness of energy. Perhaps we need to add a, little, a few more, a few more bells and whistles as we, uh, in order to try to make conjecture one precise. So should I? Yes. Uh, so for instance, uh, by your consistence as matrix, uh, could you include some models that belong to the swampland? Perhaps some models that would include with, uh, to the swampland. Could, could I exclude some, some models? Oh yes. I mean, or you think well, okay. there could be any relations? Yeah, sure, sure, sure. So, for instance, I mean, if if um, if you have 
um, let's say Gauss Bonnet graph. If that comes about somehow in your in your theory in some in some uh, uh, in some uh, uh, accurate way at at low energies, that would be excluded. This, of mm -hmm. course, was excluded already by Maldison and collaborators, but that's an example. If you have yeah. gravity coupled to R four uh, R four theory, so in fact, much of this talk is going to be about surprising constraints on the effective action of gravity. So if you get yeah. any theory that does not mean meet these non immediately obvious constraints, then that would be excluded. Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, you, you, you. The, this will be clearer as we go. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Now I want to emphasize that this conjecture one sounds very surprising, and in a way it sounds crazy. Firstly, I want to emphasize that this is only a conjecture about classical S matrices. Okay. All, all bets are off once you, once you include these. Um, we see that already from the consideration of string theory. String theory amplitudes with loops. There's a huge plethora. One for every compactification of string theory, because at loops, every compactification is different. We get this striking uniqueness on the trade -off. Okay? And, uh, uh, okay, it sounds crazy, because we're just enumerating a few simple S matrices and saying there's nothing else could happen at tree level. Okay, but perhaps it's true. That's something like conjecture one. Has, a, uh, what, 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 can I ask one more? Yes. So, 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 so when you do these three classification, type one belongs to heterotic and M theory belongs to type two? No, no, no. Um, uh, when, 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 when I do this, type one belongs to type two. Uh -huh. um, and M theory is nothing because it's worship picture is classic. Classic. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you. Okay. Yes, you know, the, reason, you, you know, you, the, the reason behind your question might be that type, uh, we know about type one heterotic duality. So you might yeah. think, well, how could type one belong with uh, yeah. type two rather than heterotic? But remember mm -hmm. that duality is it requires you to go through, go from weak to strong coupling. Oh yes, okay? sure, sure. So so the low energy consistent truncation at the two ends are just different. Yeah, sure, 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 sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Great. Excellent. So now something that that something like conjecture one should hold has been suggested on several occasions by Neymar Kanyem and may not have said it exactly in these words and may have had slightly different things in mind, but so that something like this should hold. Uh, Neymar has been saying for over 10 years, though I haven't managed to find a, a paper in which he said it, but he's been saying it in co private conversations for many times, for a long time. And um, uh, I also suggested this as a possibility in a talk I gave in strings 2018 and um, also the talk I gave in strings this year, which was Now, um, this um, sort of crazy sounding conjecture one um, implies the following two successively weaker, weaker results. First, we have conjecture two. Conjecture two is the statement that the only consistent tree level gravitational S matrix with poles of bounded spinning is the Einstein S matrix. This must be true if conjecture one is true because we just listed three S matrices two of which have poles of unbounded spin, namely the type two and the um, heterotic S matrix. Okay, so the only one that remains is I, the Einstein S matrix, it's the only one with poles of bounded spin. So if conjecture one is true, conjecture two follows. Similarly, there's an even weaker conjecture three, which is that the only consistent tree level S matrix with only gravitational poles is the Einstein S matrix. This also follows immediately, say from conjecture two, uh, so this is like a hierarchy of Russian dolls of conjectures. One implies two implies three, but the reverse implications do not hold. In this talk, I'm going to suggest a study just conjecture aspects of conjectures two and three. Conjecture one, which was included in the talk just for motivation, will not appear again except you know as to form motivational background for that talk. Okay. So my talk is about gravitational scattering, classical classical gravitational scattering. Um, but in the conjectures that I formulated, uh, we could look at the scattering of any numbers of gravitons. Three, four, five, six, seven, and so on. And the conjecture should hold for all point scattering. So let me start with the simplest case, namely that of three point scattering. Now, gravitational scattering with three gravitons is particularly simple. Um, and this is because gra well, part of the reason for this is that uh, kinematics greatly constrained three graviton scattering. In dimensions five and later and higher, all three graviton scattering amplitudes are necessarily linear combination of three structures. The first of these structures, which I've called T1, 
is the structure that comes out of two derivative Einstein products. The second of these structures, which I call T2, is the structure that comes out of the four derivative Gauss-Bonnet gravity. And the third structure, which I call T3, is uh, a structure that comes out of six derivative Riemann cube terms. Okay, and just kind of, just from kind of magic, you can show that any scattering, any any consistent gravitational scattering amplitude, quantum, classical, whatever, is a linear combination of T1, T2, and T3. Okay, so these are very special scattering, very simple scattering amplitudes. So I've just said this in an equation. The most general gravitational scattering amplitude of any sort takes the uh, three-point gravitational scattering amplitude of any sort takes the point form A times T1 plus B times T2 plus C times T3. Where A, B, and C are numbers. The dimension full numbers, but the numbers independent of scattering momenta and polarization. And so now, Kamano, Edelstein, Maldesen, and Zhibodev, in a famous paper that was written maybe six years ago, um, demonstrated the following. They demonstrated that any theory in which the three point scattering amplitudes of graviton have non zero B and C, B or C unnecessarily a causal any such theory is necessarily a causal unless the four graviton scattering amplitude in such a theory includes contributions of exchange of particles of unbounded spin so restated if we're in a theory where we don't have particles of unbounded spin then the only co only causal gravitational theories okay always i'm restricting to classical gravity right? mind you only three levels okay then uh the only consistent gravitational theories are theories in which uh, the three-point scattering amplitude for gravitons uh, has B equals C equals zero, and therefore takes the Einstein gravity form. Okay? So in other words, Camino, Edelstein, Maldesen, and Zhibidev six years ago had already established conjecture two at the level of three graviton scattering. That is, conjecture any sc classical gravitational theory with particles of bounded interacting with particles of bounded spin, it necessarily has three graviton scattering amplitudes that of Einstein gravity. Now, this is very encouraging. However, as we've just seen, three graviton scattering amplitudes are very special because kinematics tells you that they lie in a three-dimensional vector space. And the condition that we got Einstein gravity was just a co-dimension one condition on a three-dimensional vector, uh, on a three-dimensional vector space. Just two conditions in a on three numbers, and that's impressive, and it's good that it worked, but uh, is qualitatively different from what will happen at four or higher point scattering, because four point or high point gravitational scattering amplitudes uh, are, are labeled not by a finite amount of data, but by an infinite amount of data. Okay, so if we could establish something like conjecture two for four point scattering, that would be much more convincing. Okay, and uh, that's what I'm going to try to do in the stocks. The rest of the stock, I'm going to focus just on four-point gravitational scattering amplitudes, always a trigger. Okay, so in this talk, we're going to study three-level four graviton S matrices generated by local Lagrangians with a finite number of fields. Okay, what this means is that the Lagrangians in question have uh, a bound in the number of derivatives that can appear. All such S matrices are given by have the following analytic structure and momentum. You've got a bunch of exchange poles corresponding to the exchange of some little group representation um, of, of our theory. And in addition, you've got some momentum, uh, some polynomials in momentum. Okay? So, so in order to study such S matrices, what we're going to do is to break it up into two parts. First, we'll completely understand the polynomial structures. Sorry, first, we'll completely understand the pole structures. And then we'll understand the polynomial structures. Okay. So it follows that a complete classification of... Uh, uh, so let's first, first start with the pole structures. You see, the pole structures are very simple. They're all given by two gravitons inter, in scattering to give you uh, some intermediate particle, which then scatters to give you two gravitons again. And the pole contribution to, this, to such a process is completely specified once you know the graviton, graviton, particle, three-point coupling. Okay, so completely classifying all pole contributions to graviton scattering, for graviton scattering, is equivalent to completely classifying all GGR on-shell three-particle S matrices. Okay, uh, so in order to classify these pole contributions, 
what we need to do is to find all possible GGR, uh, all possible GGRs capturing amplitudes. Uh, this problem had been looked at previously in some special cases, for instance, in D equals four using spinner helicity formalism, but had not, to my uh, knowledge, been looked at in generality. So we sort of worked this out. Okay, and um, uh, what? So what? What, what exactly did we did, did we work out? Well, see, consider, for example, that the particle that we capturing that goes in the middle is a massive particle. So the ma the massive particle is uh, labeled by some representation of SOD minus one. Okay, now uh, it's not a very difficult exercise, and one we 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 performed in one of our papers is to enumerate the full list of uh, uh, three particle S matrices of the form G, G particles for every uh, uh, possible SOD little group representation. Okay. Um, um, this is an enumeration that we, uh, uh, we, could, we could do. And uh, we, could, uh, we provided a completely explicit basis Linear uh, such that every every three point function is a linear combination of these these structures, very much like I just explained to you for the graviton, for G G particle, and we also gave a complete uh, completely explicit listing of all of local Lagrangians that correspond to each of these uh, each of these three point functions. Okay, uh, and as a technical sort of um, fine, this is what we did. Okay, now very briefly, I'm going to try to very briefly explain to you the method we used uh, to perform this very simple enumeration exercise. Okay, so suppose we've got two gravitons coming together with momenta k1 and k2. Okay, now these two, these two on shell k1 and k2, um, uh, I'll give you two, two vectors in r d minus one comma one, and together they span an r11 subspace of r d minus one comma one. We call this r11 subspace the scattering two plane. Okay. Now, this, uh, uh, the, 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 the symmetry that is preserved by this, by that, that sort of, uh, that does not rotate the scattering two plane um, is an SOD minus two rotational symmetry. Now, we've got the, a massive particle interacting with these two gravitons. This massive particle appears in some SOD minus one representation. Um, that's just little group analysis. This SOD minus one is the SOD minus one that stabilizes the momentum of our massive particle and therefore stabilizes K1 plus K2. Okay. Now the gravitons that we, we are interested in, um, their polarizations, because of gauge invariance, because, you know, because there's a gauge redundancy, they, they, they transform not in SOD minus one representations, they transform in SOD minus two representations. And can be easily be seen that they transform in uh, the traceless symmetric representations of the SOD minus two that preserve this scattering two plane. Okay. So the set of consistent three point interactions are simply the most general SOD minus two invariant that can be built out of two symmetric traceless tensors. Those are the two gravitons and a given SOD minus one representation. That's the internal degrees of freedom of our massive part. Okay. And this most general invariant also has to be both symmetric under interchange of the two gravitons. Okay. So it's a simple group theory. Uh, it's a simple group theory question to enumerate all these, uh, uh, all these three point couplings. Uh, just use descent rules from branching rules from SOD minus one to SOD minus two and then Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. It's a simple exercise you can perform. We performed it and just enumerated all these couplings. And then finally, you can covariantize it, write down Lagrangians, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, from this exercise, we, there, there are two things that we pull out of this exercise. Um, and uh, uh, the, both these things follow from the following simple observation. It turns out that every coupling on our list, we've got just the most general list of all, all consistent couplings. Every coupling on our list turns out to be of four or higher order in derivatives, uh, uh, in derivatives, you know, so as, as some, they're all polynomials in momenta and all the, mo uh, the momentum polynomials start at fourth or higher order in all the three point functions that we need. Okay. Now, why did this, 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 this fact is going to be of 
crucial importance to us, both now in a simple way and later in a more important way. Um, so it's worth taking a minute to try to understand it there. Why did this happen? Why did it happen that graviton, graviton, particle, three-point functions were uh, uh, always of fourth or higher order indefiniteness? Basically, the explanation for this fact is that the three-point couplings that, that appear with uh, uh, graviton, graviton, and this particle occur like Riemann tensor, Riemann tensor particles, or derivatives on this, and therefore are fourth or higher order indefiniteness. Now, this is not an entirely obvious thing. Because, you know, you could have an, had, a, we, we, in order to get the two gravitons, we don't need to add a new Riemann tensor, right? Uh, we could have taken, like, an expansion of square root, square root G in square root GR, or we could have taken square root G. Yeah, so for instance, yeah, we could have had a term like square root G uh, SR or square root G R mu nu alpha beta, S mu nu alpha beta, and then expanded either square root G or R to higher than linear order in in uh, amplitudes, and that would have generated an HHS term. So it sounds like the existence of such Lagrangians are a counterexample to the claim I've made. Yet the claim I made followed from group theory, so it had to be true. And how, how, does, how do these two facts tie together? Well, you know, they tie together in a very beautiful way. Any Lagrangian like this that does indeed generate an HHS coupling also generates an HS coupling. Because you see that there is a path that is quadratic in this Lagrange. Now, if you, are, you have an HS coupling in your theory, it's telling you that the fields you're dealing with are not appropriately uh, defined to, be, to correspond to scattering particles. You've got to re-diagonalize the fields read, uh, to get a diagonal propagators. Then your fields correspond to actual scattering particles. And in each case, once you do that, that re-diagonalization that gets rid of these quadratic couplings also gets rid of these these apparent uh, cubic couplings. The only genuine couplings of graviton to other, other fields are of the form Riemann, Riemann uh, uh, particle and derivatives thereof. Okay, so let's, let's, let's take this observation and, and get, get, some, get a mildly interesting thing from it already. Already we've seen this. Since every graviton graviton particle coupling is uh, of fourth or higher order in derivatives, we've already seen that any two derivative theory of gravity interacting with any number of fields, okay, has no three point function, uh, three point couplings that couple the graviton to any other field. Because all such couplings started for, for a high, fourth or higher order in derivatives. Therefore, at least at the level, at least at the level of uh, uh, three-point couplings and therefore relevant to four graviton scattering, all two derivative the uh, uh, theories of gravity uh, unnecessarily truncate to Einstein theory uh, as far as exchange diagrams go. Okay? So it's impossible, you know, so this is what makes conjecture two or conjecture, yeah, let's say conjecture two even mildly plausible. You might have thought, how could it be that three-level graviton scattering amplitudes have to be those of Einstein under some broad condition? Can't we have two gravitons coming, exchanging a field, and then giving you two, two other gravitons? Well, the point is that we we want to be able to, we want to, we want to be able to do something like this in a consistent way. So we we this should never be if if conjecture two is possible is true. What I just said should never be possible in a theory that we know to be consistent. Now, two derivative theories with right side kinetic terms and so on, we just know to be consistent, right? There's nothing path pathological about that. So had we been able to construct such a counterexample of something in a two derivative theory, uh, having two, two gravitons coming and then going away and being a, something being exchanged and coming back, that would have been a clear counterexample to conjecture too. But it's never possible. Nor also that this, here we really use the fact that we're using gravity. For instance, you could have asked, could something like this be true for, uh, um, uh, for, for, for Maxwell theory or Yang-Mills theory? And in that case, it's not true. It's easy to compute, uh, to find examples of two derivative theories. For instance, phi f mu nu f mu nu, a coupling like this, which modifies tree-level photon or gluon scattering by the exchange of an axion. There are many other such examples uh, in, a, in a theory that is just completely consistent. So, Conjecture two 
if true, is a property of gravity. Okay, it uses the fact that there are that, that, that the gravity uh, field strength had two derivatives rather than the uh, electromagnetic field strength, which has one derivative. That's somehow the key point. Okay, so so so, so let's summarize. So far, we brought poles under complete control. We've got a complete scatter, a complete classification of all pole contributions to Fogg Raphson scale. Okay. Now let's let's keep mo moving. We want to completely study, completely understand classical gravitational scattering. We've completely controlled the poles. So what remains is to control the uh, uh, what remains is to control the the uh, the the polynomial structures. Okay. So now we want to try to control the most general polynomial S matrix, uh, a polynomial scattering amplitude of gravity. Now. What, is, what do I mean by control it? I mean classify it. You completely enumerate all possible such, uh, such as matrices. Now, what does this classification problem mean? Mathematically, it's very easy to state. What we want to do is to enumerate all polynomials of momenta and polarizations. Uh, but momenta that obey pi, pi square equals zero and po polarizations that obey epsilon i dot pi equals zero, that satisfy four additional problems. A, they're Lorentz invariant. B, that they're separately quadratic in all polarizations. C, that they're gauge invariant, which means left invariant under the shift epsilon i goes to epsilon i plus pi. And D, that they're both symmetric. That is invariant under S4 permutations of gravity. Okay. So this is a simple, I mean, a simply stated classification problem for polynomials of epsilons and p's. And we want to see if we can solve that classification classification problem. That's the game. Okay. Fine. So the, uh, in order to get into this, solving this classification problem, uh, I'm going to do it in two steps. The first, first we're going to solve the classification problem for things that obey all the other conditions and only a part of the Bose symmetry. And then we we'll later impose Bose symmetry. I want to, in order to see why this is, why this is, uh, uh, let, let me explain why we, we proceed that way. Okay. So let's first look at all the scattering amplitudes that um, uh, obey the conditions one to three, but not necessarily condition four, namely the condition for both, for invariance and the Bose symmetry. Okay. Let's begin with that classification problem. Now, there is a nice mathematical structure for the, for the set of these objects, okay? And that nice mathematical structure follows immediately. I mean, there's an obvious observation about this, the structure of these objects, and that's this. Suppose M is an allowed S matrix um, that satisfies all the conditions one, two, three, and, and yeah, one, all the conditions one, two, three. Then any polynomial of S and T times M is also such an S matrix. Okay, why? Because any polynomial of S and T is Lorentz invariant. Any polynomial of S and T has no uh, degree uh, dependence on epsilon, so it doesn't change the fact that M was separately quadratic in all polarizations. And any polynomial in S and T is by itself gauge invariant because it doesn't involve epsilon. So obviously. Now, this simple observation has an interesting, you know, has makes co contact with interesting mathematics. In mathematical language, the space of unsymmetrized polynomial S matrices is a module over the ring of polynomials of Mandelstam invariants. That's this is sophisticated mathematical terminology for this claim. That if M is one of what you want, P of S, comma T times M is also one of what you want. Now we can do a little bit better. Okay. Uh, it's not difficult to verify that if we don't try to impose all of the Bose symmetry, but we only impose a certain Z2 times Z2 subgroup of this Bose symmetry. The Z2 times Z2 subgroup uh, of S4 is the subgroup generated, uh, the consisting of the four elements. Identity, interchange of one and two and simultaneous interchange of three and four, interchange of one and three and simultaneous interchange of two and four, and interchange of one and four and simultaneous interchange of two and four. Easy to check that this is some Z2 times Z2, and it's as easy to check that what's special about the Z2 times Z2 is that it leaves the Mandelstam variables S and S, T, and U invariant. Okay? 
that's very important because this argument here goes through now if we impose not just one two three but also a part of four namely invariance under z2 times z2 invariance z, uh, under the z2 times z2 subgroup of uh, uh, of s4 okay so the um, if we impose conditions one two three and the z2 times z2 part of four the structure that we have is a module it's a module that we sometimes call in our paper the module the module of quasi invariant polynomial s matrices quasi invariant means that it's invariant and a part of the permutation symmetry but not all of it okay um now there's an important mathematical fact in what i'm going to be telling you about and that mathematical fact is this the space of quasi invariant s matrices well firstly the mathematical fact is this S4 modded out by Z2 times Z2 is a normal subgroup of S4. So you can mod out S4 by Z2 times Z2 either from the left or from the right. You get the same thing. That same thing is a group because this is a normal subgroup. And that, uh, that group turns out to be S3. Okay. So our quasi invariant S, our modules of quasi invariant S matrices furnish a representation of the group S3. Okay. Now, in the end, we are not interested in these quasi invariant S matrices. We are in, interested in completely invariant S matrices. But then, once we've understood the structure of these quasi invariant S matrices, getting the actual physical S matrices is very simple. All we have to do is to project these quasi invariant S matrices onto the part of the S matrix that transforms in the singlet representation of S3. That then ensures the whole thing is S4 singlet. Okay? So we break up this classification program into two parts. A, classifying these quasi-invariant S matrices, which have these nice this nice module structure. And B, after we finish this, imposing the singlet condition on, the, on, on, on our classification. OK, great. Now, we've got these nice modules. OK? So, uh, you know, if, if you know as little about modules as I did before I started this project, um, the way to think about when you think of module, think of Vera Soro representations. Okay. Any, any module can be gener so, which is an example of a module. And any module is completely characterized by its generators. Think of the Vera Soro primaries. Those are the generators. Now, the module is completely characterized by its generators as well as you know the null states, the the states that you get by acting by on the gen on the generators by these uh, polynomials, and some sometimes managing to get zero. Okay, uh, those mathematicians sometimes call relations of the module. So there are generators of the module; these are like various of primaries. There are relations which are like null states. And if you know all, you know the generator of your module, and you know all its null states, all its relations, then you completely understand this module, at least from the point of view, for, for the point of view of counting purposes. Okay, so in our paper, what we did was to explicitly list both the generators and all null states when they exist of all the quasi-primary S modules in every dimension. Okay, thereby. Um, uh, thereby, we, at least for counting purposes, we get a completely, completely, uh, completely explicit characterization, completely explicit classification of all allowed polynomial S matrices. Now, then we did more. What we did was that we also provided um, not just this module, module representation, but we also provided a completely explicit uh, parametrization of the most general descendant of the primary that was that was permutation symmetric. So in, in the end, a completely explicit parametrization of the most general allowed um, uh, polynomial S matrix in every dimension and at every derivative order. We've also given a completely explicit listing of all the Lagrangians that generate these S matrices. Now, so the full answers are very exhaustive, but the simplest part of the answer is just counting. So see, one of the things that we did was to provide a partition function, uh, which has the following, uh, which has the following property. This partition function is some polynomial, some some uh, function of x. Um, it's not quite a polynomial; it has some denominators. This d thing here, and then uh, has other factors in x. Now, the 
role of this partition function is this. If you take this partition function and rewrite it as am x to the power n, the coefficient am gives you the number of independent numbers at dimension m that you need to specify in order to specify the most general polynomial S matrix for gravity. So we worked out explicitly what these partition functions were, and I've tabulated the answers for you here separately for parity or parity, uh, S matrices, parity even part uh, S matrices in every dimension. We've also done something similar for photons. Uh, I'm going to ignore that. It's not relevant to this. Okay. I'm going to, this, this, this parametrization that I'm going to be using uh, will, will be important for the physics I'm going to try to pull out of this. Um, so after we, after we classified using this modular idea, we wanted to check that we hadn't messed up. Okay, so the way we checked was we evaluated these, these partition functions in a completely different way. The second way we evaluated them was this. What we did was to write down, was to separately enumerate all Lagrangians that could contribute to four particle scattering, modulo total derivatives, modulo equations of motion. Because we expect that there is a one to one correspondence between S matrices and, and these Lagrangians, modulo field redefinitions. That's why the modulo equations of motion. And uh, this enumeration was a separate enumeration that we could do using some matrix model techniques. Uh, where the matrix model was uh, an SOD matrix model whose role was to, in, in, uh, to uh, ensure that our polynomials were Lorentz invariant. Okay, um, the whole, uh, it's, it's an intricate and complicated thing and I won't go through it with you. Just the important point is that it's completely independent enumeration that we performed partly analy analytically, partly numerically, but in every case we reproduced this partition function bang on the nose. So we're very confident that our results uh, are right that we've given the most general classification of four graviton polynomial scattering amplitudes. We've not missed out anything. Okay, so so far in this talk, we've gone through a lot of uh, detailed kinematics and. Uh, um, um, Shiraz? Yes. In your table from eight, nine, and ten, Ohio. Yes. Uh, it seems to be just the same function, right? Yes. Yes. Why, why is that why the case? You ask it? Let's let's look at. Um, um, uh, let's look at even partition functions to start with. You see, uh, uh, sorry, even scattering amplitudes. Suppose you've got four gravitons coming. Okay, any four gravitons mark a three-dimensional subspace of the plane of uh, the space in which you're scattered, mm -hmm. right? Because they're characterized by p1, p2, and p3, and p4. But p4 is some sum of p1, p2, p3. So the three momenta p1, p2, p3 give you a three-dimensional space. Now, in addition to this three-dimensional space, you've got uh, polarization vectors. Uh -huh. So these four polarization uh -huh. vectors, so let's say the first polarization vector lies uh, in this three-dimensional space plus one new direction. So that's a fourth direction. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And the next polarization vector picks out a fifth direction and so on, okay. sixth and seventh. So there are uh -huh. seven dimensions. Uh -huh. uh, I'm ignoring parity uh -huh. odd for a moment. There's some complications of parity odd. Sure, sure, sure. But, but for when we're doing parity, even there are seven dimensions that play a role in scattering, and the remaining dimensions are just spectators. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, <laughs> that's why the parity. And then there's some similar considerations you can do for parity. Uh, parity. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, excellent. Okay. Great. So now, now we've completed the classification program. This is, you know, essential but uh, sort of dry part of the of the work, right? It's just kinematics. Uh, it's sort of cool though, you know, we just have control over the most general possible polynomial scattering that you want to do. Actually, uh, maybe I should postpone this, but actually we can control in some sense the most general possible index structure of scattering, whether polynomial or not. But uh, that's not relevant to the talks I'll get. Okay. Um, yeah, so now what we want to do is try to do some physics with this. Okay. Now, Recall that what we've done here is like the first step of, of the CEMZ program. In their program, the first thing they did was make the ob completely trivial observation that every three graviton scattering amplitude is parameterized by three numbers. And then they went around using physics to try to constrain those three numbers. Now what we've done is the, done the equivalent of that. It's much more complicated. There are all these possible pole exchanges. There are these infinite number of polynomial terms. But we've got complete control o over all of that. We've got completely explicit ca characterization of this infinite dimensional space. 
as you see, it's much more complicated as opposed to the three three numbers of C and Z. Um, there is a sense in which I would have to explain this to you properly, but there's a sense in which the data in high enough dimensions is parametrized by 10 unknown functions of S and T. Okay, it's, since every function is an infinite amount of data, that's a lot of data. Now what we want to do is to see if we can constrain the, the data that appears in this scattering amplitude using physical principles. Okay, and uh, uh, in order to do that, I'm going to turn to something that at first sight sounds completely unrelated. I'm going to turn, turn to an analysis of correlation functions in conformal field theories and the chaos bar. So bear with me for five or ten minutes, uh, and then we, you'll see the relevance of what I'm saying to scattering. Okay, so now we're switching peers. We're not doing scattering amplitude anymore. We're not just studying gravity. We're, st we're studying conformal field theories. Okay. What I'm, going, what I'm reminding you of in this slide is some kinematics. Um, consider the ordinary, the normal time-ordered four-point function of four identical operators inserted on an xt two-plane in some conformal field theory. The conformal field theory need not be two-dimensional. It could be four-dimensional or seven-dimensional or whatever, uh, if, if a seven-dimensional conformal field theory exists. Uh, it could be whatever, whatever dimension. But we are going to insert our operators just in two, on a two-plane, plane formed by x and t. And the operator insertion points are given as follows. First, I give you the insertion points labeled by x and t. And then I also give you the insertion points la labeled by the light cone coordinates z and z bar. z is x minus t and uh, z bar is x plus t. So operator 1 is the point that starts at x equals e to the power rho naught. Sorry, x equals minus e to the power rho naught and t equals 0. And then is boosted to the past by boost parameter tau. Operator two is the is the operator that starts at x equals rho naught t equals zero, and then is boosted to the future. And operators three and four are points that were located at x equals one t equals zero and x equals uh, minus one and t equals zero. Okay, we're going to be studying this configuration in the limit that this tau, this boost parameter, is large. Okay, so if we take tau to infinity holding rho naught fixed. Um, it's a simple method to determine the normal conformal cross ratios that people call Z and Z bar, and then some uh, the cross ratios sigma and rho, which are defined as sigma squared is Z, Z, Z bar, and rho is equal to half of log of Z bar. Oops, Z by Z bar, should have been, not Z by Z. Okay, half of log of Z by Z bar. I believe, wait. Yeah, half of log of Z by Z bar. Okay, um, fine. Um, the important, one important thing to keep in mind is that when tau goes to infinity, the sigma squared becomes very small. Z, Z bar, uh, both Z and Z bar become very small. Okay, Z and Z bar uh, are the, uh, um, well, you see, it's, yeah, that's, I'll say. Now, the kinematical configuration that I reviewed for you, that I wrote down for you in the previous transparency, uh, has a name, it's sometimes called the Regge limit of conformal field theory. Okay, and it's a limit in which sigma, as we've seen, vanishes. And sigma becomes very small. Now, what was sigma? Sigma was z, z bar, and z, z bar, z and z bar each become small if z1, 2, and z3, 4 become small, similarly with z bar. So there is a simpler configuration than the one that, I, that I've written down for you here, in which z and z bar are small. These are the configurations in which the operators one and two approach each other along some spatial plane, and operators three and four approach each other along some, or let's say, in the same spatial plane. Okay. This is another limit in which z and z bar, and therefore sigma, is small, and uh, is the limit in which we uh, conf uh, conf correlation functions become simple because you can use the operator product expansion. You op one and two, you op three and four, and you can everything simple. Okay. Now, despite the fact that the, the reg limit, this limit that I wrote down here, and the OP limit, the limit where along spatial slices you bring one and two together and spatial slices you bring three and four together, despite the fact that they're the same conformal cross ratios, they're physically distinct. And the difference is in the causal relations. In the OP limit, all four operators are space-like separated with respect to one another. This is essentially a Euclidean correlation function. In the reg limit, on the other hand, while the pair of operators one and four 
are mutually separate, space-like separated from the pair of operators two and three, these two operators are not space-like with respect to each other. One is in the causal past of four. And similarly, two is in the causal past of future of three. So these situations, despite the fact that they have the same cross ratios, they're not the same physics. And they have different physical values. It's a different branch of the same uh, um, correlation function. Okay? And uh, uh, it's a very interesting place to look. Now, the reason that these, this, this radial limit forms is of interest to me is as follows. In their famous chaos bound paper, Maldus and Ashenker and Stanford, uh, whenever they did this, uh, demonstrated that in any large N CFT, the four point function of four identical operators, that's easy to extend, cannot grow faster than one over sigma, uh, which in our language, remember, sigma was like e to the power, one over sigma was like e to the power, so tau. So in our, for our configuration, which means that these four point functions cannot grow faster than uh, uh, one of uh, each of the part tau in the configurations that we talked about. Okay, in any large NCFT, general arguments demonstrated that this was the case. What I will now do is try to use this chaos bound together with ADS CFT to motivate a conjectured bound on flat space scattering, which will then allow us to cut down most of this space of uh, of uh, uh, classified S matrices. Uh, can you also briefly explain why it is called chaos bound? Why is this called chaos bound? Yes, at the moment this does, it looks like it has nothing to do with chaos, right? But you see, suppose you take um, the chaos bound that you might be familiar with was something about OTOCs in a finite temperature uh, yes. quantum mechanical system. Yes. Okay. Yes. Now, suppose we take this uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, this this two point function, <coughs> and let's see if I can get annotate to work. Mm -hmm. uh, let's and uh, now let me try to move to a, an empty slide. Yeah, great. Can you see this? Oh yes. Okay, excellent. So suppose I take a, a plane. I'm in Euclidean space to start. Yeah. Okay. So suppose I take a plane. I'm in Euclidean space, and I do <coughs> the quantization of this thing such that radial slices are slices in space, yeah. and angular slices are slices in time. Yeah. Okay. With such a quantization, uh, the pl ordinary plane is a finite temperature theory because my time is a circle. Yeah. Okay. In fact, it's finite temperature theory with beta equals 2 pi. Mm. Okay. Now, suppose we had some correlation functions that were uh, inserted at these points in mm -hmm. Euclidean time, but then move to Lorentzian time. This is like the OTOC. Yeah, yeah. The Lorentzian time now is a boost. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So that gives you a configuration that goes like this. These two operators are not boosted. They were just inserted where they were. Whereas the other two operators were boosted. Let's say the one that started at rho naught is boosted like this. Mm -hmm. It's taken to positive tau, which is boosting like this and taken to positive tau, which is boosting like this. Yeah. Okay, and this is precisely the Rege configuration that I told you about. Yes, yes. So the Rege configuration that I told you about becomes an OTOC in the quantization in which radial slices are space and theta slices are time. Uh -huh, and it's uh -huh. sort of interesting that the the fact that thing that was an OTOC in this quantization turns into an ordinary time ordered correlation function in this quantization. This is related uh -huh. to the fact that while uh, that while um, <laughs> <laughs> boost time goes forward here, it goes backward here. So the notion of time ordered changes between boost time and ordinary time and turns this just in an ordinary con uh, uh, correlation function. So, 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 yeah. Okay, so basically the net summary is this. Uh, the OTOC story when applied creatively to the right quantization of flat, of, of flat plane gives you a bound on the re uh, Regis scattering of zero temperature radius scattering of conformity. So it's the it's the maximal Lyapunov exponent with beta to two pi. Exactly. Okay, maximal Lyapunov exponent with beta. Exactly. Oh, thanks Just a lot. Right. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and sorry, when, when you said this is holding for larger NCFTs, it's larger NCFT with gravity weakly coupled gravity dual. No. Uh, the as long as we have a a CFT in which all correlation functions factor is. 
Ah, or that ah. obey, obey large and counting, then this uh, this holds irrespect. So so just uh, CFT with parametrically large central charge or something. You said you know. That's right. Okay, if for thank you whatever much. reason the correlation okay. functions factorize, okay, that's yeah. all that's used in the proof. The, okay. the fact okay. that four point functions are product of two point functions plus one by n square times connected. Ah, that's yeah. all that you. Okay. Thank you. For whatever reason that happens, it will work. So one way is gravity dual, but it's more general. Okay, it could happen with some weak coupling or something. Hey, anyway, yeah. Okay, other questions? Okay, excellent. Okay, so, um, so, 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 wonderful. So, 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 let me, yeah. Um, right. Uh, now, what I'm going to do now is to try to explain how uh, this chaos bound, together with ADS CFT can be used to motivate a simple statement about classical gravitational scattering in flat space. Okay, so what I'm going to do is sound st to start with a little funny. This, by the way, is the stuff in the paper that has not yet appeared. Um, uh, consider a conformal field theory. I mean, we had a rough idea of how it would work in our in our first papers, but we we try to make it precise in this paper. Okay. Um, consider a conformal field theory due to gravitational theory in ADS in the usual manner. And what I'm going to do is parameterize ADS by, you know, I'm going to think of all of this kinematics in, uh, in embedding space. Okay, so ADS is the space manifold x square mi equals minus one in the embedding space R of D comma two. Okay, uh, as you may be familiar, uh, boundary points in ADS space uh, in this abstract embedding space language can be thought of as null rays in R D comma two. That is null, null vectors modulo positive scalings. Okay, I will use this parameterization of the boundary because it's convenient, but I will always use it in a way such that the nature of the boundary point is very clear. So consider a point which in normal global coordinates, tau and angle on, on, a, on a d minus one dimensional sphere um, has coordinates tau and you know, a unit vector pointing to the point of the d minus, minus one dimensional sphere. That boundary point is labeled by the embedding space coordinate cos tau, sine tau, n a hat, where n a hat is the unit vector, right? So it's a very transparent labeling of boundary points that you're using this embedding space. If you're not familiar with it, it doesn't matter very much, but at the point tau and n a hat. Okay. Now, for our purposes, it'll be sufficient to consider n a hat that vary just on a single circle on the, uh, on the sphere. So in other words, we will be able to get away by considering just the points cos tau, sine tau, cos theta, sine theta, and all other coordinates zero. Okay. Now consider what I just explained to you and look at the look at the insertions, cos tau, sine tau, cos theta, sine theta, that's point one. Point three, okay, is, well, these are the insertions. I'll tell you what, what it means in language. Points one and three are inserted at time tau. Points two and four are inserted at time pi. Points one and three are inserted at angle theta and minus theta. Points two and four are inserted at angles zero and pi. Okay, so in space, the points come up, appear diametrically opposite to each other. One and three are diametrically opposite to each other. Two and four are diametrically opposite to each other, and but the diametric opposite has a sort of angle between them. In time, the points one and three are separated. One and three appear at time tau, three, uh, two and four appear at time pi, and uh, uh, we will always be in the range so that tau lies between zero and pi. Okay? So uh, this is the insertions of four points that I'm going to look at. Now these four points are characterized by some conformal cross ratios and I've worked them out for you. We'll come back to now, what I'm going to ask you to imagine is taking this fixing theta in your mind and moving tau. As you move tau, you pass through two special values that I want to explain to you. The first special value is the boundary of this range, tau equals zero. So when tau is equal to zero, uh, when tau is equal to zero, uh, something special happens to these boundary points. The special thing that happens to these boundary points is that if you look, okay, if you look at these four vectors, in general, they span the four-dimensional space 
that you can see here, made up of this, 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 and this. Any linear combination of these, of any four-dimensional vector can be written. In general, little, uh, it's a linear combination of these two. In other words, in general, these four vectors span an R2, comma 2 in embedding space. However, tau equals zero, this becomes one and one. So it's in the same direction, same time direction as this minus one and minus one. And so at that special point, these three vectors span not an R2, comma 2, but an R2, comma 1. There's one few. It's a, it's a special point. Related to this, this correlation function here diverges as computed from the bulk. The correlation function diverges as we go to tau equals zero. Now, in terms of conformal cross ratios, tau is equal to zero, okay, is uh, rho is equal to zero because the numerator and the denominator cancel. And so, uh, when we reach this r1, uh, this tau equals zero, r2, comma, one point, um, we get a divergence like one over r to the power a, where a is a number that you can compute related to the total number of derivatives in this scattering S matrix element, but we will not bother to, uh, to, to compute it for current terms. Okay. Uh, the second point that's of interest is the following. Okay. Oh, and I should tell you, the most important thing about this is this. This correlator diverges, and the coefficient of this divergence is very special. It turns out that the coefficient of this divergence is completely controlled by the S matrix, flat space S matrix of this theory. Okay, the flat space S matrix of the bulk theory at scattering angle theta. Um, I don't have the time to explain this to you in great detail. Uh, but this is a beautiful fact. It's related to papers that were written by Penedonis and collaborators early on, Pulchinsky, and uh, most recently by Maldesena, Zhibadev, uh, and Karen Ho, and uh, uh, si Simon, uh, Simon Duffin uh, on the, the bulk point paper. These, these ideas play into, into this, and this, this was basically understood in those papers, so we made it a bit more explicit. Okay. Now, the second special value of tau is tau equals theta. The reason the tau equals theta is special is this, that if you look at the causality of the causal relations between these operators, uh, the causal relations between these operators, they flip when tau goes through theta. When tau is greater than theta, the causal relation between these operators is that of the Rege regime that we talked about. Okay. On the other hand, when tau is less than theta, there's a, sex, there's a different causal relation, which I've written here, but we don't have the time to go through. Important point is that the causal relation switch, switches at tau equals theta. Okay, tau greater than theta is where chaos bound appears. It's rigid. Tau less than theta is where there is a point, namely rho equals zero, where the answer for the s for the for the correlation function is completely determined by the flat space s matrix uh, in in this theory. Okay. So now we're almost home. You see using the relationship to the flat space S matrix in the neighborhood of tau equals zero, in the neighborhood of rho, rho equals zero, one can an analyze that just on general grounds, analyze that and demonstrate that the correlation function scales like one over rho to the power A, sigma to the power B, where A is some number that will not be of importance to us, but B is very important. B has the following form. If the flat space S matrix scales like S to the power B plus one in the reg limit, that is large S and fixed T, then this correlator scales like one over sigma to the power b. This was true outside the Rege limit. This was true in the causal planes that was appropriate for tau near zero, which is not the same causal regime as the Rege limit. Okay? But the next thing one can do is by analyzing the bulk integrals, demonstrate that if we are interested in small theta and tau, so we're interested in small values of sigma, the full correlation function as a function, the leading behavior and sigma of the correlation function is this one over sigma to the b times some f of rho, which where f of rho is an analytic function and can be continued from this other causal regime to the Rege region. Since this function is analytic, if it's non-zero here as it is, it cannot be zero in any, any interval in the Rege region. And therefore, we conclude that if the flat space S matrix grows with a uh, a B that is greater than one, the correlation function in the Rege element grows with sigma with uh, in a may, way that violates the chaos bound. 
Okay, and this this connection is very tight and very precise. Okay, so it follows that ADS CFT with a bulk Lagrangian that has a, that would have has interaction terms that would generate an S matrix which grow like S to the power B plus one with B greater than one. In other words, with an S matrix that grows faster than S squared. Okay, would be in, would give you correlation functions that were inconsistent with the chaos one. This is true for particles of all spin. It's very general. Okay. So this observation now uh, leads us to make the following conjecture. We conjecture that classical theories whose S matrices grow faster than S squared in the Regi limit are unphysical. We have, of course, used ADS CFT to motivate this, about, this, this conjecture. I believe you should be able to prove it more generally, just starting in flat space. We don't yet have a proof for that. But uh, uh, the Connection, the tight connection with the chaos bound makes it very convincing, I believe, that this is true. Okay, that something like this should be true has been suggested by many people, including Nima, Zhivadev, Karen Ho, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, I'm sorry I'm going over time. Could I have like seven or seven minutes more or something like that? Sure, please go ahead. <laughs> yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, uh, fine. So now we're in business, you see. A, we've done classification. B, we've done some physics. So we have a criterion. So what we're going to do now is to just run through our classification list and ask which of these theories that we've classified, which of these Lagrangians, uh, S matrices that we've classified, obey the pro obey our physical criterion. That is, in the Rege limit, large S fixed T, grow slower, grow no faster than S squared. Okay. First, let's do this for the polynomial S matrices. Okay. We run through a whole list of polynomial S matrices, and we find that there's, once you do that, there's, you find that there is exactly one S matrix, apart, of course, yeah, just exactly one polynomial S matrix that does not violate uh, what we call the CRG conjecture, the classical Rege growth conjecture. Okay? And that S matrix is an S matrix that scales, that is given here. It's epsilon 1, wedge epsilon 2, wedge epsilon 3, wedge epsilon 4, wedge P1, wedge P2, wedge P3, the whole thing squared. Squared means like, this has there is mu indices and then you contract it with the same mu indices like it's like Maxwell squared f mu nu squared that way. The the Lagrangian that this S matrix comes from is the second Gauss is the second Lovelock Lagrangian and it's explicitly written here. No other polynomial S matrix, okay, is consistent with the CRG conjecture by itself is consistent with the CRG. Okay. Now, uh, so what we have so far concluded is if we're looking at terms involving only gravitons, the Einstein action, the gauss bonnet action, and the Riemann cube action, uh, these are so far allowed because they generate, apart from polynomials, they generate exchange diagrams. We've not yet looked at those. And the chi six give you the most general possibility for, uh, for uh, Lagrangians that obey the, uh, that so far obey the CRG conjecture. Okay. Um, now, one thing I want to point out here is that this chi six, uh, this S matrix here, obviously vanishes in six and lower dimensions because it's made out of a weight product of seven vectors. Okay, and you see that from the fact that chi six in in uh, uh, seven in seven uh, in uh, six dimensions is a total derivative, and chi six just automatically identically vanishes in five and lower dimensions. So this classification of possible terms in the pure gravitational sector has no chi six and d less than equal to six. You only allowed Einstein, Gauss, Bernier, and Riemann cube. Okay, so far we've done what we can by just looking at just polynomials. Now let's look at the exchange contributions. Okay, let's first look at the contribution of exchange just from gravitons. Okay. Um, if we look at exchange contributions just from gravitons, that's the exchange contribution that follows from this Lagrangian. Well, what we did was just explicitly evaluate the exchange diagrams coming from this Lagrangian. It's a quadratic form in the numbers A, B, and C. When we evaluated the S matrix and then just asked which of these S matrices, when does this S matrix not violate the CRG conjecture? The answer turned out to be that for any S matrix that has any B or any C non-zero, it violates the CRG conjecture. So the only one that's allowed now is Einstein. So in particular, the CRG conjecture reproduces the uh, uh, Camino, Edelstein, Maldesena, Shibadev result. But of course, it's given us much more. 
Because Camino, Edelstein, Mandelstein, and Schubert have nothing to say about four Riemann kind of terms. All of those are ruled out by the CRT. Okay. Um, sometimes when I give this talk, people are a bit puzzled uh, by the following point. Uh, they're puzzled by the point that people often say that exchange of a spin 2 particle always grows in the Rayjay limit like s to the power 2. Exchange of spin j particle always grows in the Rayjay limit like s to the power j. In the, here, when we were looking at gauss bernay and so on, we were exchanging spin 2 particles. How could I have possibly violated the CRG conjecture? The answer to this uh, apparent puzzle, it's not really puzzle, it's just loose wording in what people say, but it's, uh, is that this s to the power j is true for t-channel exchange. It's not true for u-channel and uh, s-channel exchange. And it's the u-channel and s-channel exchange that violates this, this growth. Uh, more physically speaking, uh, this thing that violates the growth is a contact interaction in impact parameter space. This s to the power j applies for all things that are not contact in impact parameter space. Contact interactions are additional to this common folklore statement. And it's those that violate the CRG conjecture in the case of, let's say, two gauss bernays factor. OK, I said that. Fine. Now, in the next two, three minutes, I'm going to rush through the more general part. So far, we've looked at exchanges of just, uh, uh, of, uh, just uh, gravitons. Now let's look at the exchange of a more, most general massive particle. We are able to do this because we completely and carefully classified graviton graviton um, four point uh, massive particle interaction. In fact, it turns out that the key element here is the thing I highlighted that all these interaction S matrices are always four derivative or higher. Using this fact, we were able to show that all con all exchange contributions to graviton graviton scattering from particles, uh, from massive particles, all of them, without exception, always violate the CRG conjecture, provided we're in D less than equal to six. Okay. Moreover, the violation of, uh, uh, of, uh, of CRG is of a form that cannot be compensated by adding another violating local counter term. I told you that the polynomials always violated CRG and exchange always violated CRG. You might have thought maybe some linear combination of the two can be CRG allowed. That never is possible. Now, it is possible for two exchange contributions to be added up to not violate the CRG conjecture, but only if one of the exchange contribution comes with the wrong sign. The sign of an exchange contribution is completely fixed by the positivity of the kinetic term and the reality of the, uh, of the three-point couplet. So in a theory in which all kinetic terms are the right sign and all, uh, inter uh, all interaction terms are real, all exchange contributions, all the violations always add, never subtract. And therefore, in a good theory, uh, the CRG conjecture excludes all exchange contributions, of any, any finite number of fields, um, um, at least a D less than equal to six. Okay, so that's the end of the talk. I'm sorry I went so far over time. Um, in this talk, what I first presented was a complete classification of four graviton and four photon classical S matrices in the theory whose Lagrangian has a finite number of derivatives and a finite number of fields. We then presented a conjecture about the allowed growth of S matrices in classical theories of gravity, the CRG conjecture. We use this conjecture to completely classify allowed gravitational theory, uh, uh, allowed classical theories of gravity up to Lagrangian terms of Riemann that have Riemann to the five or higher. These were not classified because they don't impact for graviton scattering. It would be very nice to uh, understand if our square you know, understand our square conjecture better, and uh, if possible, to replace it with a clear argument directly in flat space. I call it a conjecture because you know, to motivate it, we used ADS CFT. We went through ADS and then finally came to flat space. And it seems very indirect. There should be a nice, uh, general, simple flat space argument for this thing. Uh, we're working on this, but we don't have a clear answer. I mean, there are many hints, but no clear answer. It would be very interesting to understand the status of this, the ambiguity that we found in D greater than equal to seven, the second Lovelock term. Is it a genuine ambiguity? Is it really allowed? I very much doubt that's the case. Uh, if not, what is the physical argument that excludes it? Okay. Finally, uh, okay, then using ADS CFT, we can take our results into con constraint and stress tensor of four-point functions in the large n limit. Our results suggest, perhaps they prove, that the only chaos bound allowed large n TTT four-point 
TTTT four point functions that receives contributions from a finite number of single trace exchange blocks, in addition to the usual double trace exchanges from gravitons, is the one generated by the Einstein action of the bus. It would be very interesting to generalize the results of this talk to the scattering of more than four gravitons. We've stuck to four gravitons. We have nothing to say about five or six gravitons. I have the feeling that it should be possible to do it in some inductive way, but I don't yet know how. And finally, if all this works out, we could try to get more ambitious and generalize the study of the stock beyond, uh, beyond local S matrices with the hope of establishing conjecture one, uh, accounting for infinite number of fields, infinite number of derivatives, and trying to establish one, uh, the uniqueness of string theory, classically at least, from low energy constraints. Thank you very much. Sorry for going so far. Uh, thank you very much for a very, uh, very interesting talk. So it's now time for a question. We still have uh, like 15 minutes, 10, 15 minutes for question and answers. Thank you for not stopping me, even though I went so far. <laughs> uh, hi, Shras. Uh, can I ask a question? So um, about the function f of law, how do you argue that is a an additive function? Um, but oh, you argue that, that just part. from the explicit bulk expression for that function. You know, so let me let me go back to this this thing and let's hope I can annotate it. Um, annotate. Great. Okay. So you see, this function takes the following form. It's Propagate. So suppose we've got these four. We've got these four points. And then there's some point x here. So the function takes the following form. It's a product of four propagators times a vertex element in the bulk. I should emphasize that I'm not. You can maybe even say more in direct and formal field theory. But I'm looking at everything that comes from a bulk of a particular sort, right? With a local Lagrangian. So there's a product of four propagators and there's a vertex term in the bulk. Now the propagators are a little more complicated because they've got polarization factors because we're dealing with gravitons. But in this cartoon slide that I'm going to... Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, my screen's good. Yeah. Uh, in this cartoon slide, I'm going to ignore all of that. I'll just pretend we were scalars. Okay. So uh, uh, the, the general prop is of the form P1 dot X to the power delta. 1 over p2 dot x, 1 over p3 dot x, and 1 over p4 dot x. p4 dot x, and then whatever we get here from the interactions. There's some interaction stuff which will play very little role. In the, I mean, it'll play a role in the, the sigma, but okay, let me explain. <laughs> now what we do is to first take, take this thing and go, go to small sigmas. So sigma goes to zero. This allows us to simplify these expressions very much in the way, if you're familiar with the, with the work of Penedonis, Polchinski, Sully, and Himskirk. They did something very similar. Um, this allows us to simplify the expressions to leading order in sigma so that you can pull out a sigma to the, to the appropriate power times, an exp, uh, times a function here that is a function only of rho. It's some integral expression for some function that's a function only of rho. And then by explicitly examining this, this function, we can just demonstrate that it's, that it's analytic. In fact, it's a function of rho that has a branch cut. And going from this, what we call the time-like Regge region, the place where the causality relations were different, to the space-like Regge region is like circling around this branch cut and coming here. So we can completely, you know, just by explicitly writing down what this function is. In, ter in terms of propagators that we know and vertex factors that play no role because they're all polynomial, um, we can explicitly, you know, give an explicit integral representation for this function and demonstrate its analytic. In fact, for simple cases, we can even just compute what it is. So it's by writing it down in the bulk and examining the integral representation for it. That's how we establish that it's analytic. That's a short answer. Was that clear? All right, um, any further questions? I 
actually have a little bit of philosoph maybe philosophical question. So, uh, what um, can you also introduce like uh, other like massless spin one particles in in your discussion? And does that going to uh, get you some universal um, amplitude? Yeah, uh, right. Now, massless spin one by itself violates universality hmm. for the following reason. Uh, well, well, the reason is more general, but let me give you an example. Suppose I take this plus uh, del phi, the whole thing squared, plus m squared phi squared. Okay? This is a clearly good theory. Nothing's wrong with it because it's two derivatives. It's the kind that appears in string theory, right? This could be like an axion or a delta or something like that. Okay? Um, now, in such a theory, we have an exchange contribution of this form. Okay, so we get an exchange contribution for a massless spin one theory that depends on this mass here. We could take a, a linear combination of several such contributions with different masses. Actually, there are many such couplings that you can write down. Not just with the scalar, I just, just gave you the simplest example. So already we see that just massless spin one by itself. Okay, massless spin one by itself, in each sector it violates universality. Um, it's possible, yeah, so the, the short answer is does, does not seem very universal. It's possible that if you put more conditions somehow, then there, for instance, if there's super symmetry and uh, this F mu nu is part of a super multiplet, then almost certainly we'd be able to argue for universality for that. If you put some more conditions, you probably would, might get some universality, but just master spin one by itself doesn't, and therefore master spin one with gravitons will not be at least completely universal because there'll be a sector that's not possible I'm saying I've thought about it too little and there's more to say but that's my first response was the question about this or the massless factor in the internal line and whether it affects the purely gravitational amplitude oh was that the question about a massless uh, factor? I'm not sure <laughs> I, I, well I wasn't asking that question but that's also interesting <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's gonna be very tough right because we're going to have to have a uh, ah no, yeah, it's going to be very tough because you see, uh, we're going to have to have a graviton, graviton, uh, massless vector, but gravitons are not charged under gauge fields. So such a coupling will be zero. Uh, yeah. That's going to be very tough. Uh, 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 so, so, so if you don't have loops, uh, only three point one. Uh, yeah, yeah, I see, I see, I see. Uh, right. Right. Uh, uh, three letter, okay. Yeah. You know, yeah. please go. No, no, sorry. It's just, just uh, <laughs> imagining like, uh, I mean, can, can there be like analogous ar argument as like CEMZ for the like massless uh, spin one particle so that like, you, you should have like a tower tower of massive spin one states. Yeah, so, so this is a, a counter example, yeah. right? CEMZ would say that you cannot modify for photon scattering unless you have an, an infinite tower. But here, I don't have an infinite tower. I have only a scalar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, 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 but of course, like, I, I think in this case, I, I also want to couple uh, with, the, with gravity, right? not, not just max. Uh... You also want to couple with gravity. Fine. But let's also couple with gravity. So we have square root gr plus square root g f mu nu f mu nu mm -hmm. plus these terms with square root g. Yeah. Right. It's still a counter example. Right? Now, it's possible that if you put some more conditions or you want to say a little more, but, but I think at some big level, at, at this general level, it's just, this doesn't work. Let, let me say why it doesn't work. You know, what made gravity special? What made gravity special was that R mu nu rho sigma. The three-point functions always involved this guy, and this was too dead. For this reason, any three-point couplings between two gravitons and something else was always four dead, as I reviewed in my talk. And uh, it's plausible that for this reason, it's, these couplings are excluded. On the other hand, for the gauge field, the photons came with F mu nu, and two Fs was two derivatives. And so if you could write down a coupling, it cannot be excluded. Two derivative theories just are good. And we can write down such a thing. By the way, 
the same reasoning tells us that if we have a spin four field, uh, we might exp ex expect it to be uh, worse. I think if you pursued, though I haven't done it carefully, but I think if you pursued, pursued this line of thought, you would get another way of arguing that higher spin theories just don't exist. If they do. You see, gravity was on the edge. Right? For gauge theories, we, we could do a lot. Gravity is on the edge, we could do very little, just Einstein gravity, plus maybe string theory. Higher spin by itself, massless higher spin, I think we'll just be able to, if, if we cared enough to do that exercise, since we already know it's true, but if we cared enough to do that exercise, similar analysis would just tell you, I think, that it just, that there is no theory of higher spin, which we know is true, yeah, which agrees with in flat Okay, so now, well, this time uh, could, I, could, could I ask one more question? Please, yes. Uh, could I ask one? Uh, I'd be very so, happy. Uh, for the case of four graph, uh, for the case of four graph down scattering with the scalar exchange, you can also yes. expect you, you lose amplitude. Yes, great. Is so, there an easy way to see why this one is not? Yeah, this wrong? one is very easy to see. Ah, uh, so the. Uh, the four graviton scattering amplitude of the scale exchange. Exactly. The an so the qu uh, the question is, you gave this counterexample for gauge bosons. Why can't I make the same counterexamples for gravitons? Right. So let's write down the Lagrangian that would generate this in a two derivative way. The Lagrangian that would generate this is a ph phi square root gr. But, but now, once you've said this, you know the answer already. You see, because whenever you've got something multiplying r we can absorb that into R by a field redefinition. That's called going to Einstein frame. And once we've done that, this coupling goes away. Now, you might think this is a bit of a cheat. Who told me that I needed to do this field redefinition? Can I work in the original choice of field so that I haven't done this so that I get the contradiction? But that's not good. You need to do this field redefinition. Why? It's because, forget cubic order, there's a quadratic order coupling between fields in this Lagrangian. It's a, fee, uh, it's a coupling that goes of the form phi del squared h. So when you work with this choice of fields, you've got a quadratic, you're working with propagators that are not diagonal. So, no, so your fields are not representing particles. So what you have to do is to do a field redefinition to get rid of this mixing. But the not precise, the linear, the, no, uh, the going to Einstein frame is precisely the nonlinear version of that linear field redefinition. So once you've done that, now we just have square root gr h, and this coupling, this three-point coupling, just does not exist in the two derivative. Did that answer the question? So could could you also have the term that phi uh, square root g some? Sorry, I, I missed the question. Could you ask it again? Uh, so, so if I consider phi square root of g and an r square, that, that okay. kind of phi vertex. Phi square root could... g r square. Yeah, now this could be a genuine couple. Actually, in this particular case, if you write just r, uh, because r appears in Einstein's equations, it's not, it won't give you anything interesting, but let's look at this. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. This is genuinely true. It gives you a correct exchange diagram, but it's an exchange diagram in a Lagrangian that was four derivative. So it may or may not be consistent. And it, we explicitly evaluated this one in our paper and violated the CRG convention. Okay, so I it's see. fine. You can write it down, but it gives you scattering that that is. So if so, what's the precise statement? You took a ADS theory with a scalar field like this and R. Actually, in ADS, we put, put wild, which is the same thing. Okay. You put, uh, you put, uh, you put that in the bulk and you compute the four point function of uh, four gravitons, four stress tensors. You will find a result that violates the chaos. I see. Right. So you can write down a Lagrangian. That's Thank the you. important thing about this. It's not just kinematics that rules it out. You can write down these Lagrangians. The question is, are, are they generating consistent physics? If they were two derivative, they have to. If they're anything higher than two derivative, you don't know. And this does not generate consistent physics. At least it, 
appears not to because with an ADS CFT violates a chaos bound, equivalently violates the CRG conjecture, which if you accept, you know, this going to going to ADS is not a conjecture. It's a proof. I see. Yeah. Did, did, did I answer your question? Uh, yes, yes. All right, so uh, are there any further questions? Okay, uh, now since time's up, uh, let's, let's thank our speaker again. Uh, okay, thank you everyone 